Hi everyone, my name is Emma. Um, I'll be hosting today's webinar. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. In the meantime, you can introduce yourself in the chat box. Um, it should be right below. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending our webinar, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy for Early Psychosis. My name is Emma Parrish, and I'm um, with the MHTTC and the Early Psychosis Learning Collaborative. Our webinar is sponsored by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration's New England MHTTC, as well as our Early Psychosis Learning Collaborative. The New England MHTTC aims to disseminate evidence-based practices to promote the resilience and recovery of persons at risk for living with or recovering from mental health conditions in their loved ones. We provide training, technical assistance, and resources <coughs> in the field in the New England region. If you're interested in joining our mailing list, please see the link that will be in the webinar notes in just a second. Um, as well, the Early Psychosis Learning Collaborative is a group of people dedicated to learning about and implementing evidence-based practices for working with people in the early stages of psychosis. We're planning on providing webinars, a psychopharmacology consultation line, cognitive training, clinical briefs, case consultation, and technical assistance. If you're interested in the EPLC, the link will also be in the webinar notes. Um, and these two opportunities are specifically for our participants who are in the New England area. So I'll be turning things over to our speakers shortly, but first I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. Please be sure to mute your speakers if you're calling in, and remember to mute your microphones. The computer speaker can be muted by pressing on the green horn on the upper left hand or middle corner, um, which should be above my webcam picture. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can use the chat and questions box on the bottom left. If we have time at the end of the session, I'll round up the questions and we'll answer them. The event is being recorded, and the recording link will be shared with you all after the event. You'll be able to review the chat and re-watch the presenters using that link. It is my pleasure to announce our speakers today, Dr. Michelle Friedman-Yakubian and Dr. Brandon Gadiano. Dr. Michelle Friedman-Yakubian is the clinical director and co-founder of the CEDAR Clinic, a treatment program for youth experiencing symptoms of clinical high risk for developing psychosis. She's an instructor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and has focused her career on the development, implementation, and evaluation of psychosocial interventions for young people experiencing early psychosis symptoms in their families. And Dr. Brandon Gaudiano is an associate professor of psychiatry in the Alpert Medical School of Brown University and a research psychologist at Butler Hospital. His work focuses on psychosocial treatment and transitions of care for individuals with severe mental illness. As a senior investigator in Brown's Mindfulness Center, Dr. Gaudiano investigates in acceptance and mindfulness-based treatments for psychosis, including acceptance and commitment therapy. So without further ado, I present to you um, Dr. Friedman Yakubian and Dr. Gaudiano. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much, Emma, for the introduction. Hoping everyone can hear me OK. Um, I see from the chat box that folks are tuning in from all over the place, which is really exciting. And I'm really, uh, Dr. Gaudiano and I are really looking forward to starting a conversation about acceptance and commitment therapy for early psychosis. And we're really looking forward. I know all of you are out in different places. Some of you might be or trying to get some other work done at the same time, which is what I do when I attend webinars as well. But I also really hope to hear from you with questions and thoughts, and for this to be the start of a collaboration around acceptance and commitment therapy for early psychosis. So um, we'll start by telling you a little bit about what acceptance and commitment therapy is. Oh, here's our disclosures. So we'll start by talking about what is ACT and what is the evidence base for ACT for psychosis, which Dr. Gaudiano will uh, be providing an overview for. We'll then move into talking about the application of ACT for first episode psychosis and for clinical high risk for psychosis. And finally, we'll finish off with a case example and some time for questions. So thanks, so, uh, Michelle. Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to say that, um, uh, Michelle, why don't you take this first uh, part, and then I'll come back on, and uh, we'll kind of switch off. But hi, everybody, and um, talk to you soon. Thanks, Brandon. We're all getting used to the new technology, which is pretty exciting. So we're, I'm glad that it's all working and we can all hear each other. So ACT is a behaviorally-based intervention that is really about uh, understanding why people get stuck in their lives and how to help people get unstuck. ACT focuses on the skills that are necessary to live and develop a rich, full, and meaningful life. This is accomplished through acknowledging and accepting that pain is inevitably part of life. And the goal of ACT is to help individuals let go of some of the habitual practices that maybe unconsciously engage in to avoid feeling bad. Um, so we'll be talking some more about that. <coughs> Excuse me. One of my uh, favorite quotes is from Russ Harris, who wrote ACT Made Simple. And uh, the, he states that the goal of ACT is to create a rich, full, and meaningful life while accepting the pain that inevitably goes with it. So really what this means is that pain is a part of life. We all get to experience a range of emotions and difficult thoughts and feelings. And it's really not the experience of difficult thoughts and feelings that causes trouble for us, but all the efforts that people do to try to get rid of unpleasant thoughts and feelings. So behaviors like staying in bed all day, using substances. For me, it might be the 12 candy bars I ate while I was trying to get ready, ready for this talk. All these things um, can be understood as avoidance tactics that can strip vitality and meaning from people's lives. And these habits can be really hard to break. So in ACT, the way to break these habits is to get in touch with one's personal values and to mindfully live life according to those values while accepting the unpleasantness that comes up. So we'll be talking a lot more about that today. So the primary focus in ACT is to help clients let go of the control agenda, which is also known as unwillingness, or experiential avoidance. These are all the things that humans do unsuccessfully to try to make unpleasant experiences go away. The chronic use of these strategies is called psychological inflexibility. So here in this, uh, let me see if I can get pointer to work. We've got the, uh, there we go. So we've got the feelings monster. This guy has unworthiness, self-doubt, anxiety, lots of great emotions that we all get to experience. And this poor guy over here is holding on for dear life, trying to keep that monster from pulling him into the pit. And that can be what it can be like to all the efforts to try to avoid experiencing those emotions. In the next group, this guy looks a little bit more relaxed. So he, he dropped the rope. So instead of trying to have the, pull the monster into the pit and get rid of him, he's just kind of not engaging with him. He dropped the rope. And so, you know, that monster might be yelling over there saying, come on, you want to pick up the rope. You know you want to struggle with me. You know you don't want to have me around. And the guy can still see them, and he can still experience those emotions, but he doesn't have to struggle with them anymore. And that's really the goal of ACT. So in ACT, we work on increasing willingness, which is also known as acceptance, and the ability to accept and make space for the experience of difficult thoughts, feelings, emotions, impulses, while taking steps towards chosen values is called psychological flexibility. So in ACT, you're making space for difficult internal experiences while taking action towards values. So another metaphor is the struggle switch. When the struggle switch is on, a person is trying not to feel those emotions, and it can feel like being in a whirlwind, trying to get rid of anxiety. 
And when the struggle switches off, the anxiety is there. It might get increased, it might go down, but the person isn't struggling with it. The person's making space for those emotions and feelings. A really useful feature of the theory behind ACT is that these concepts cut across diagnostic categories. So virtually all human beings engage in experiential avoidance. So the same ACT model has been applied to target these processes which underlie a range of conditions, including depression, anxiety disorders, diabetes, chronic pain, addiction, parenting stress, and even psychosis. And there's actually been a good deal of research on ACT, especially within the last 15 years. This is a recent meta-analysis from a diverse group of ACT and non-ACT researchers that looks at the treatment's effects on a wide range of psychological disorders. Overall, ACT outperforms all the control conditions with a medium effect size difference. Act effects on primary outcomes were not substantial, were not different from CBT, um, but it holds up pretty well against all of these other conditions. So act formulation, metaphors, and strategies aim to increase willingness and often are the gateway to engaging in other treatments, such as exposure and response prevention for OCD is an example of a treatment that's pretty difficult to engage in uh, will bring up a number of difficult experiences and emotions in order to engage in the treatment. And so um, ACT is a, a formulation that can be very helpful for increasing a person's willingness to engage in that treatment. Sorry, I was just looking at a note asking about light source and wondering if that makes a difference for people. So it just turned off a light. Okay. So ACT, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how ACT differs from some other traditional therapies, just in terms of a conceptualization. So in this box on the left, we have a characterization of kind of the inside blue box is the person's symptoms, the outside green box is life. And at the start of treatment, the symptoms are taking up all of the life. There's very little space for life outside of that. In many traditional therapies, including CBT, the goal of the treatment is to shrink the symptoms. So you shrink the symptoms, that box gets smaller, there's much more space for life around it. In ACT, the focus is different. So you start in the same place, symptoms are taking up a good portion of life, but post-treatment, your goal is not to change the symptoms, not to change the size of the symptoms box, but instead in ACT, your goal is to build the life. So the idea behind ACT is helping people take valued actions in order to do all the things that are necessary for a rich, full, and meaningful life while not necessarily expecting or waiting for, I got a note saying the webinar just turned off and I just turned my camera back on. Oh, okay. I just turned my camera back on. I don't know. There's some technical difficulties or for some reason it just kicked me off. Okay. Um, hopefully people could still hear me. So in the second, in ACT, what we're trying to do is expand life around the symptoms. Now the big secret that's out there and from research supports this is that symptoms often do go down. And yet it's not the focus of the treatment. So in order to reduce experiential avoidance, and increase psychological flexibility, it's really important to be willing to have those symptoms and to build life despite where the symptoms are at. And thanks for folks who said, uh, you sent me a note saying they have no trouble hearing me, which is great. Okay, so 
I'm going to talk a little bit more about <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit more about the different processes or parts of ACT. So uh, this is a representation. Some people might be familiar with the ACT triflex or the ACT hexaflex, which are the different processes that ACT targets in order to help people to create psychological flexibility. So this is the willingness to experience thoughts, feelings, emotions, and internal stuff while doing things that matter. I'm going to talk through each of these different areas. So the first area is be present. So this is making contact with inner experience. Some people have heard the terms mindfulness or self as context associated with this. So mindfulness means paying attention on purpose to the present moment without judgment. Many people these days have had some experience with mindfulness or some exposure to mindfulness. And there are a lot of misconceptions about mindfulness. Often people think that mindfulness means being still or meditating, which may or may not be indicated uh, for some people with psychosis. But mindfulness really means engaging with what's happening in the here and now. So I can practice mindfulness while doing this webinar where I mindfully kind of notice how my body is responding when different technical issues arise. And notice and uh, help turn my attention back to the content of what I'm talking about. But here's some examples of different um, present moment or mindfulness exercises. They can include uh, more meditation-like things, like paying attention to the breath or noticing different parts of the body. But other examples can be something quick, quick like clapping and noticing how long the sensation lasts on your fingers listening to music with full attention, playing with a pet, or there's a variety of mindfulness concentration games that can be really fun to do with young adults in a group. Another concept that comes up is self as observer, um, which is separate from experiences. And so sometimes people can get overly identified as being defined by their experiences. This can happen, for example, with someone who's experienced a lot of trauma who may identify themselves as a victim and may have a really hard time uh, taking chances or trying new things because their life experience has suggested it just won't work and it's not worth it. Or some of our clients who experience psychosis may become overly identified with their diagnosis and decide that as a person with psychosis, they can't take steps towards engaging in new friendships or trying new programs, or maybe overly identified with a, a previous identity uh, as being a student at a particular university, for example, and be really unable to let go of the idea of connecting with a new school or changing uh, a career path. There's a, a few different metaphors that can be useful for helping people to better understand the idea of the self as observer. Uh, one example is the sky. So uh, here in New England, we've had a lot of crazy weather. Some days have been extremely rainy with lots of clouds and wind. Some days today is actually pretty pleasant where the sun is out. And kind of despite the changes in weather, the sky remains the same and it's always there. Uh, so we think about, we might encourage someone to think about themselves as the sky with uh, weather that's changing and experiences that's changing, um, but they hold it all. So the next area is open up, which means making room for thoughts and feelings without resistance. Uh, some different processes that focus on that include diffusion and acceptance. So a few words about acceptance and willingness. Uh, this involves allowing thoughts, feelings, internal experiences to be as they are and opening and up and making room, so dropping the struggle. Here we've got that same cartoon again with the guy who's dropping the rope. A few words on what acceptance is not. There are some misconceptions about what acceptance means that I've come across when talking with other clinicians or trainees that are learning about ACT within our center. So acceptance does not mean passively accepting a bad life situation rather than taking action to change it. It doesn't mean bucking up. It's not a technique, okay? 
So it's not somebody who's experiencing a painful, difficult, abusive relationship. Acceptance is not about just accepting that being in a bad relationship is part of their life. What acceptance might be is accepting and understanding all the painful feelings and uncertainty that will show up when that person takes action to get out of that relationship and better their lives. So acceptance is a process that involves practicing being willing to make room for thoughts, feelings, internal experiences that come up while doing things that matter. Another concept that can be useful in ACT is the idea of pain versus suffering. So in this cartoon, we have a young man who has gotten a poor grade on a test. This is a painful experience that I think most of us can relate to. What can turn that experience, which is naturally painful, into suffering depends on what the person does in response to that pain. In one scenario, the teen accepts that this is painful and takes action in line with their values to try to improve their grade. Maybe they meet with their professor and ask for some additional help or try to find a study buddy. In another scenario, the guy gets the F on the test and he does everything he can to try to get rid of that feeling or avoid having it again. Maybe he beats himself up and goes over and over in his mind what an idiot he is. Maybe he blames other people, like his teacher, and sends him a nasty email telling him he's a terrible teacher. Maybe he decides it's just too hard to face school and stops going altogether. In all these situations, the pain becomes amplified by his actions, and this is what we call suffering. So if you can't get rid of your fears, you can learn to live with them. So here's another uh, cartoon uh, showing some of the ideas behind ACT. So another area that we talk about is cognitive fusion. Uh, what this means are cognitive fused beliefs are fixed beliefs, rules, judgments that seem like self-evident truths to an individual and influence their willingness to engage in valued actions. So here we've got these fish who managed to jump out of the water, and they're saying, whoa, that's the stuff we've been talking about. Um, the experience of defusing or creating some space from a fused belief can be kind of like that. So, whoa, I didn't realize this was a viewpoint. I thought this just was, is what, what it is. So uh, another uh, metaphor that's been used, uh, and Ralph Harris uh, kind of describes this as well in Act Made Simple, is the idea of kind of wearing glasses that highlight all the difficult things, all the fused beliefs, judgments, and rules. Um, so here's an example of some of the different kinds of fused judgments and rules that show up among our clients in the Cedar Clinic. And the goal of defusing in ACT is to help people, it's almost like you're trying to help the person kind of take the glasses a little further away from the face. It's not that the glasses aren't there, it's not that you can't see those rules and judgments anymore, but the, you can also see around it as well, and that's, that's a goal. And this is a little bit different than CBT, where you're trying to change the experience or change the thought. With ACT, instead what you're trying to do is create a little bit of space between the person and their thoughts, even to just notice it's a thought. Here's a variety of different defusion exercises. Um, sometimes just talking about the mind and recognizing what the mind is doing can be part of defusion. Thinking about how useful it is to get all caught up in what your mind is telling you right now. Uh, thinking about the fact that words are a collection of sounds that humans have given meaning to, that our minds take very seriously, but are really um, not necessarily as serious as we might think. And also helping people think about where their fused beliefs came from, how long ago they started to have those beliefs and, and what the origin was can create some distance. 
I'm actually going to um, do a little defusion exercise with all of you right now, if you're willing. So uh, those that are uh, doing other work at the time will probably get confused because things will get silent for a minute. But I, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think of a nasty belief or judgment about yourself that has shown up in your mind recently. Uh, for me, an example is I am incompetent and everyone will know it. That's shown up for me a lot while I've been preparing for this webinar. So if you're ready, what I'd like you to do is I want you to focus on it. And if you're by yourself, maybe what you can do to make this even more authentic is to repeat this thought out loud. So whatever it is for you. For me, it's I'm incompetent. Other people may come up with something else. I want you to do that for 30 seconds. Ready? Go. Okay, thanks for those of you that followed along. Um, now what I'd like you to do is something a little bit different with that thought. I want you to think of that judgment again. But this time I want you to add this phrase first. I'm having the thought that. So for me, I would be changing it up to, I'm having the thought that I'm incompetent and everyone knows it. Now, I want you to add one more phrase. Add, I'm noticing I'm having the thought that, and add in the rest of that. So that's an exercise. Um, some people may have done this and just felt lousy because they were fusing with a difficult judgment or belief. Some people may do this and find that adding those little phrases beforehand changes up that experience a little bit, creates a little bit of distance. And that experience for some people can be useful in just um, demonstrating what we're talking about, creating some room, almost removing the glasses. Again, the thought, I'm incompetent, can still be there. But when I change it to I'm noticing I'm having the thought that, it, it modifies it a little bit, creates a little bit of distance. So the last part I'm going to talk about right now is really the crux. This is Do What Matters. This is what ACT is all about. It's about helping people identify their values and to take action in line with their values. And all the rest of this is about helping to remove the barriers to doing things that matter to the person. So in ACT, we talk about values versus goals. Uh, a value is something that a person strives for, a way of living that they want to be in the world. A goal is something you either do or not. So someone might have a goal of finishing their college degree. At the end of that, they've either done it or they haven't done it. Changing that to a value might be something more like, I value learning and increasing my education. So in ACT, we try to help people identify their values and to think about the actions that they can begin to take immediately to start living their life more in line with their values. So now I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Gaudiano, who's going to tell us about ACT for Psychosis Research. Hi, everybody. Can you see and hear me OK? Great. Okay. Well, thank you uh, so much, Michelle, for that really nice, uh, succinct overview of ACT, which I, I hope was helpful to everybody. Um, you know, we're trying to, some of you might be quite ACT familiar, and some of you probably aren't. So we wanted to make sure that we don't um, get into too much detail without going into the background first and, and making sure we give you an overview. And now what I'm going to be mainly focusing on is giving you sort of an overview, too, of what we know and, and also what we don't know about ACT research. And I know that um, there might be some uh, 
a little difficulty with my webcam image, and, and I think it's from the backlighting. Unfortunately, I tried to change that and haven't been that successful. It's coming okay across on my computer screen, so it just might be a little bit different depending on how you're viewing it. Um, but uh, hopefully some of you can see me. I'm not completely in a shadow. Um, but like I was saying, so we want to give you an overview also of ACT Research, and then what we're going to do is I'm going to turn it back to Michelle after um, some time, and then we're going to talk more about the application specifically uh, to early psychosis. So let me see here. Okay. So one thing that I do want to point out is that ACT is an intervention that is um, really one of these newer mindfulness and acceptance interventions that have been de uh, developed for psychosis, and it's one of several. And there are others out there. ACT just happens to be, um, at least at the current time, uh, one of the more uh, well-established in terms of research. But there is emerging research going on with a lot of um, these other interventions as we speak. And um, I think some good work being done in there. So there's applications of metacognitive therapy, uh, person-based cognitive therapy for distressing psychosis, compassion-focused therapy, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and, and other approaches. And recently, um, I, I edited a book. And what we did was to try to understand kind of what is out there when it comes to these approaches, including ACT, and try to understand what are the similarities and differences, and what, what can we kind of distill um, from these third wave CBT interventions that are being applied to psychosis. And a few themes came out. Um, one uh, is this issue of using mindfulness, and, and in particular, using it in relation to, to psychotic symptom experiences. And so what we mean by this is that the individual is um, acknowledging that they're having the experience in the moment, but the um, focus is, like with um, other types of mindfulness to experience, um, not evaluating them, not necessarily evaluating them as true or false, uh, and sort of reserving judgment. And even though that can be difficult, um, that is something that we can apply just like with other thoughts and experiences um, to psychotic experiences. So these, these interventions tend to have a focus on that. Um, they also, of course, tend to have a focus on uh, acceptance and also uh, self-compassion because of the importance of self-stigma uh, in this population. And when we talk about um, acceptance, um, again, we're not necessarily talking about accepting the experience for what it says it is, but instead for accepting the experience for what it is. So this is willingness to experience any kind of uncontrollable thoughts, feelings, sensations, including the psychotic experiences, and instead showing um, compassion toward oneself um, and openness toward them without getting kind of caught in, uh, caught up with them, um, or um, uh, sort of struggling with them um, or distracting from them. So sort of just letting them be where they are. And in terms of um, sort of another broad theme is this issue of uh, helping people with their values or really what's important to them in their life. And as we know, especially in severe mental illness and psychosis, the issue is often functioning. It's often quality of life. And um, really, these interventions are designed to focus much more on that side of the equation and helping the individual to live a more full and desired life despite any experiences that they might be having along that psychotic spectrum. So my colleagues and I, we did a, um, uh, an early meta-analysis on these therapies. And, and overall, and, and this included the ACT studies at the time, and overall, what we found was that there was um, a reasonable effect size on primary uh, outcomes that sort of was in a medium range, which is similar to other CBT interventions compared to the control groups um, in terms of psychotic symptom improvement. So um, generally, you know, we've seen some positive effects for these types of interventions, similar to what we'd expect to other CBT interventions. We also found some evidence that these interventions were successfully targeting mindfulness, acceptance, and compassion um, uh, constructs, and that those changes in those uh, targets were predictive of outcomes. 
um, at least again in a preliminary fashion. So some evidence that um, these interventions are focusing on those themes of mindfulness, acceptance, and compassion. Uh, this slide I pulled together here is really just a summary of what I know um, to this point, up to this point, on ACT for Psychosis. And um, as you can see here, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but just to kind of give you an idea of the uh, breadth and scope of the research so far, um, what you'll notice from this slide is that um, increasingly, increasing numbers of studies being conducted over recent years. Uh, some have relatively small samples. Some are pretty large. Um, ACT has been applied to both inpatients and outpatients, both acute and residual phases of illness. Um, most have been uh, randomized controlled trials to this point, although there are some open trials. Also, uh, ACT has been done in group and individual formats. And um, ACT has shown uh, improvement relative to the control conditions uh, used in these studies uh, on a number of different outcomes, including things like rehospitalization, uh, symptom improvement, uh, impairment, uh, uh, improvements in functioning, distress, uh, negative symptoms, uh, depression, command hallucinations, experiential avoidance, uh, other mood symptoms, things of that nature. So, you know, overall, there are an emerging um, bunch of uh, a, a group of studies out there that is that are working, and people are saying there might be some um, problem with the connection. I'm I'm uh, just sort of looking at this now. I don't sure everybody can hear me or not. Uh, how, how am I sounding out there? How are things working? Looks like most people. <laughs> thanks everybody for. Uh, it's great to have this live feedback from. from from 80 plus people, which is great to see um, this this group here. So yeah, it might just be your internet connection. Um, you know, there might be some lag, and that might might uh, uh, make a difference for you. So sorry if not everybody is hearing me clearly. I'm just uh, going to try to speak as clearly as I can, and and hope that the issue resolves for you. But thanks for that feedback. So when it comes to um, these ACT studies, we don't have time to um, kind of go into all the details, obviously. I just wanted to highlight one early study that I conducted that was done on an inpatient unit um, using ACT with um, people with acute psychosis being treated on that unit, Get, just to give you sort of an idea of uh, some of the research, some of the findings. Um, so this was the second ever um, clinical trial done of ACT for psychosis. And like I said, it was done in a Philadelphia inpatient unit. And um, basically, uh, we randomized patients, 40 total, to either treatment as usual or treatment as usual that uh, included ACT. So again, in terms of treatment as usual, um, you know, this is what you would expect in terms of uh, an inpatient unit where you have pharmacotherapy going on, you have other types of interventions going on. And for those who received the ACT condition, um, integrated into their care, they got additional um, individual sessions of ACT. And as you can see, they're on average three sessions uh, total. And that's because this was an acute care unit and the average length of stay was about one week. Um, and in terms of what we looked at for assessments uh, that we assessed at admission and discharge, we looked at a range of psychiatric symptoms on the brief psychi psychiatric rating scale, um, perceived disability related to illness on the Sheehan disability scale. Uh, we also asked um, patients to self-rate their psychotic symptoms in terms of the distress that they uh, found associated with them their believability in them, in their psychotic symptoms, and also how frequently um, they were occurring. And then we tracked patients over four months post-hospitalization to look at their um, rehospitalization rate. And one of the challenges with this type of work, uh, doing it in an inpatient setting, um, is that, uh, you know, length of stays are brief. Um, as you as you probably are aware, and um, length of stays are also unpredictable. So we basically had to make each session sort of its own self-contained ACT intervention. So each session followed on those themes that I have up there on the slide, and then across the different sessions, we would just focus slightly on a slightly different um, 
uh, sort of topic that uh, related to those themes. But in general, we kind of went through this approach where the focus was on building acceptance for any kind of unavoidable psychological distress that the uh, patient was experiencing, including any psychotic symptoms that they were actively experiencing. If they were having those uh, psychotic experiences, um, trying to identify where they were struggling or avoiding or getting sort of lost or um, meshed with those psychotic symptoms and instead get them to practice to acknowledge them but to refrain from judgment, not try to evaluate them, treat them as true or false, just sort of let them be. Uh, make room for them but not get caught into them, in other words, and from a mindfulness standpoint. And then third, despite any of these symptoms that they might be experiencing, uh, we wanted to help them to identify and work toward valued goals, even while on the unit. So, you know, they might not be able to do the full um, amount of activities that they would do otherwise, but we tried to link whatever they were doing on the unit to these broader life goals and what was important to them. The key thing here, though, again, is to notice compared to what we would do in traditional CBT for psychosis is there was no real attempt to directly change their beliefs um, about psychotic symptoms or to change the psychotic symptoms themselves. Instead, what we're really focusing on here is changing the way that they relate um, to these experiences. What are they doing in reaction to them? Um, what are they doing in response to them? How are they acknowledging them and being aware of them? But then what do they do next after that and trying to change that process for them? So just to highlight a few outcomes that I think um, people might find interesting. So one is that, um, as you can see here, we found that there was um, a, a difference with treatment as usual in terms of their distress related to their psychotic symptoms, in this case hallucinations in particular. Um, so that the ACT group showed a decrease in hallucination distress, where, as you can see, treatment as usual, it really didn't affect it uh, much at all. Same thing on the Sheehan, that we found um, a difference in terms of the ACT group showing a decrease in their uh, perceived disability, whereas no change in treatment as usual. We also wanted to look at their symptom improvement, although that's a bit tricky, right, with an inpatient acute treatment setting because we would expect everybody to improve over time. That's somewhat a, um, you know, a fairly large determinant of discharge. So the way we looked at it was looking um, in particular at what we would term clinically significant change admission to discharge, and that was greater than two standard deviations change from baseline in their symptoms on the BPRS. And as you can see there, in particular, what we found that those who received ACT um, changed in was their associated mood symptoms. They had much greater change in that, which I think, again, goes back to the distress and the, um, uh, and the disability ratings that you saw earlier. So overall, symptoms improved more. Uh, clinically significant change in the ACT group, but that was mainly driven by the mood symptoms. And um, one thing I would note is that if you looked just at psychotic symptom um, severity itself, what we found was a fairly parallel decrease in both groups and no more decrease in uh, severity um, improvement uh, for psychotic symptoms in the ACT group, pretty much parallel change. And again, that's consistent with um, the intervention and what we're trying to target here, which is more the person's relationship to their symptoms, even though they were getting other interventions that were also contributing to lowering their psychotic symptoms overall, including any antipsychotic medications they might have been prescribed. Uh, one thing that we also were interested in looking at was um, sort of were we uh, able to affect uh, uh, sort of the constructs targeted by ACT and were those related at all to the outcomes that we were seeing. So what you see in that bottom um, figure is basically just representing that what we found is that the ACT group uh, had greater reductions in um, psychotic symptom distress and also showed um, a lower um, rate of rehospitalization over those four-month follow-up. And what we found is that there was some evidence that 
um, our, our measure of believability of hallucinations, which we considered sort of a, a proxy or a way to measure that diffusion process, seemed to be uh, somewhat accounting for these greater improvements in the ACT group. So overall, believability of hallucinations, um, sort of whether they treated these hallucinations, whether they were sort of judging them as true or false or not, um, that that um, did predict um, to some degree their their distress and also their rehospitalization, but that there was greater change in the ACT group uh, on that measure. Now, all the stuff that I presented to you up to this point was really based on uh, research protocols, um, things where we were doing things different than normal clinical care or things that were different than what was being done already on the hospital unit. Um, often we were bringing in personnel, bringing in therapists who were doing these treatments. They weren't part of the uh, normal hospital treatments for these patients, and um, they weren't necessarily done by the providers who were actually seeing patients um, on those units day to day. And um, that's kind of uh, what we found over recent years is that even though we've built um, uh, quite an evidence base, uh, you know, for ACT for psychosis, it's still not being used that much. And, and part of it is that there really hasn't been enough effectiveness or implementation or dissemination work that's been done in this area. And, you know, what we see is that typical research practice divide is that um, there aren't a lot of hospital units. Um, there are some. Um, there aren't uh, as many maybe as could benefit from using approaches like ACT. Uh, partly because there's sort of a disconnect between the research that's been done to date and sort of what the realities of clinical practice are. So what we want to do is, is also be focusing as we move forward on research that's going to help bridge that divide for us. And one of the projects that I'm recently um, uh, just completing is what we call our REACH uh, project, which is stands for researching the effectiveness of acceptance-based coping during hospitalization. And basically, uh, what this grant was supporting was to figure out how we can take the ACT research protocol done by research interventionists and actually adapt it for a working unit to be delivered by the personnel, by the um, hospital treatment providers who were on that unit and what that would involve in terms of integrating ACT more into the hospital unit treatment. And so as you can see there, we started with an open trial where first we took that research protocol, we uh, talked to our stakeholders, we, we got feedback, and we tried to adapt it to the realities of the uh, clinical unit that we were implementing it on. We then recruited some patients to implement it and have the um, people, including nurses that we trained, uh, social workers who were on the unit, and also even um, we had a good number of occupational therapists um, who were delivering a lot of the groups who also um, got the training and were implementing the treatment. We looked again at the um, baseline and discharge assessment and four-month follow-up, and then we used that information to further revise and refine the protocol and the training um, materials so that we can then move into a randomized phase of the study which we did next, where again we recruited patients. This time they were randomized to more of a real-world um, sort of coping um, or real-world intervention um, type of situation um, where they either received the usual hospital treatment with um, ACT treatment, which I'll describe in a little bit, um, or a more supportive therapy condition where instead of getting an ACT-based treatment, they got sort of time and um, attention-matched um, interventions that were from a supportive standpoint. We also, again, looked at baseline discharge and four-month follow-up, and, um, and this was still done in a pilot way to mainly look at things like feasibility, acceptability, um, again, to refine these uh, protocols to scale up, um, hopefully, for a, a future uh, randomized controlled trial that is fully um, powered for that purpose. So I see someone um, made a, a nice uh, uh, question that, that I think you know, we might as well answer now. Um, Susan asks, where did the trained hospital staff find the time to deliver the practice? Boy, that's a great, <laughs> that's a great question, right, because that's part of the challenge of doing this kind of work is that if we're bringing in new interventions, we have to have the support in terms of training and supervision. So um, one of the things that we did was we found 
the um, we did some initial trainings that we, that the hospital supported in 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 providing some brief time for staff to do that as part of their normal practices of professional training. But then we used more their standing supervision and weekly meeting groups to also meet with them on an ongoing basis to um, continue the training, to support them in the implementation, and also to focus on issues of uh, fidelity and competence and things like that. So um, just to give you an overview of kind of the model that we were using that we called ACT IN, which Act for Inpatients. Um, so this included both some group and individual sessions. Uh, we obviously used the group format because that is very typical of an inpatient um, setting. We also found that it's important, though, to try to add in this individual component, which can be hit or miss these days on um, inpatient settings. I know some do and some don't. We think it's important and wanted to really push for that as, as, as part of effective treatment. We also um, added in a transition program where we had to come up with a way to transition people out of the hospital that was feasible. And increasingly, what we're finding is that um, hospitals and hospital systems and insurers are looking for transition programs. So we also had um, uh, hospital staff call patients once a week for the first month post-discharge just to kind of do a brief check-in with them of about 15 minutes to encourage them to continue to use the um, ACT techniques that they um, learned while they were in the hospital and to help them uh, support that. And then we looked at a number of different outcomes and targets that you would expect um, that I talked about previously. Now, we're still in the, in, in the process of, of um, kind of crunching all the numbers, but just to give you some highlights or some uh, sense of what um, we found in terms of some of the outcomes, uh, we, we did have an open trial sample. You can look at the demographics there. They're fi fairly, uh, I think, typical um, of this population, maybe a, a bit more females than we would have expected in our, in our final open trial sample. And we did see some improvement, um, as expected, in terms of just change from baseline on the brief psychiatric rating scale and some increase in our mindfulness scale as well. And, um, you know, it's hard to look at change just from admission to discharge. We were really kind of looking at was there at least some improvement that was sustained through four-month follow-up compared to baseline. And, and, and generally, we saw that with some attenuation of effects. Um, also, you know, one of the things that we, we we're looking at in terms of the pilot RCT to see if we could get a signal for that again as well was that uh, this idea of rehospitalization and what we're looking at here. So again, this is sort of going back to that original uh, Philadelphia inpatient study. That's a survival curve, which is time to rehospitalization post discharge over four months. And basically, the steeper the line, the faster that people were rehospitalized. And as you can see, there was a faster rehospitalization in the treatment as usual group. And so we were looking for, could we find a similar signal of effect um, for the, um, the ACT treatment uh, in the Providence sample that was implemented by our hospital staff. And it looked like we were, we were seeing similar effects here. And what was particularly interesting about this is that, remember, that the people that we were giving the treatment as usual to, they received a supportive intervention that was time matched. So again, there might be something here protective about ACT. It might not necessarily change their um, symptoms uh, overall in terms of their psychotic symptom severity, but it might be having some protective factor for rehospitalization that we often find in, in certain CBT-based um, interventions. But there are plenty of lingering questions, as you might um, guess is the case. And um, so I just want to point out that I think the research is still too early to really be able to understand, you know, there aren't direct comparisons of ACT for psychosis, CBT for psychosis, especially in different um, settings to kind of understand what might be the similarities or differences there. That goes the same for our mechanisms of action. We're not really sure if ACT is more specifically targeting mindfulness and acceptance than traditional CBT. And I think probably the most practical question that we really don't know that much of, because there hasn't been that much research done to date, is on how, your, how ACT can be combined within a system of care for individuals. So within um, 
uh, coordinated specialty care with other CBT interventions, sort of where does ACT fit in, how would we use it best, and I think um, we're going to have Michelle talk a little bit about what her group's findings uh, have on that, but we certainly need a lot more uh, research on this to, to get a better sense of what's going on here. So now I just want to um, now refocus us back. I sort of gave you a bird's eye view of what we know and don't know about ACT research, and I want us to now start focusing back on ACT for early psychosis. And just to orient you all, I'm sure a lot of you, based on um, looking at your uh, affiliations and where you work, you probably are, are pretty um, well-versed in this, but just for those of you who might um, be interested in a little background. So, you know, one thing we're, we're interested in, right, is this idea of first episode psychosis, often occurring in or starting in late teens, mid-20s. Estimates are about 100,000 uh, adolescents, young adults per year in the U.S. Uh, have their first episode. And, of course, though, these first episodes often have uh, problems that persist and they don't go away. So high rates of relapse, high rates of functional impairment, and definitely um, other comorbid disorders, depression, anxiety as well. And currently, um, sort of our best uh, evidence-based research support a coordinated uh, specialty care uh, type of um, uh, treatment approach, which includes uh, psychotherapy, family support, supported education, case management, pharmacotherapy, all those pieces, pieces in more of a team-based care model. And also, uh, in addition to sort of these uh, individuals with first episode psychosis, we also are interested in uh, patients that fall into this clinical high risk for psychosis category, right? And so this indicates um, several syndromes that indicate elevated risk for developing a psychotic illness within the next few years. And the most common is sort of this development of attenuated or subthreshold psychotic symptoms for which the individual might have insight and might recognize um, that their mind's playing tricks on them but still having some problems with that that are emerging. And we also might have individuals who have some kind of family history risk and some recent functional decline that we are concerned about or those with um, psychotic symptoms that are coming and going but not necessarily persisting. And uh, what we're finding is uh, emerging research supports promising new interventions for reducing the worsening of these systems, uh, excuse me, these, these uh, symptoms, excuse me, um, including, as you, um, we've talked about before, medication, CBT, family-focused treatment, and integrated care. And SAMHSA recently invested more than uh, $10 million in the development of community programs for outreach and intervention for youth uh, with clinical high-risk psychosis. And we now have some mounting evidence that there are several treatments for youth at risk for psychosis that have been shown to reduce um, the rates of transmission to psychotic disorders. And so as you can see illustrated in this graph, on the y-axis we have the percentage who developed a psychotic uh, disorder within a year. And uh, generally, young people at high risk for psychosis without treatment or in treatment as usual have about a 20% rate of uh, transition per year. And um, the bars um, there under the control group sort of represent their rates. But then when we look at the other conditions and various um, experimental interventions and uh, more active interventions targeting this group have been tested, what you find is that they generally show um, reduced transition to psychosis. And these include CBT, family therapy, low-dose medications, and um, integrated specialty care. And um, those sort of lower, those can lower the transition rates by about 50%. Okay. Now I think um, at this point, let me turn uh, our attention back to Michelle, if she's still there and can log on here. And she's going to talk about the clinical application of ACT for this uh, group of uh, patients with early psychosis. Thank you very much, Brandon. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about ways in which we have been implementing ACT within the CEDAR Clinic, which is a program for youth at risk for psychosis, as well as the PrEP program, which is a program for youth in first episode psychosis. And 
talking about some of the adaptations that one might make when it comes to working with younger people experiencing early psychosis symptoms. Now, one thing I want to point out is this is a very new area of study. As far as I can tell, no one has yet published specifically on working with youth in first episode psychosis or clinical high risk in terms of studies. There are some chapters that have been written that talk about some considerations, but this is a very new area. When it comes to adapting these uh, act for first episode psychosis or clinical high risk, really it's not, uh, in our, my experience, it hasn't been very different from what Brandon described, but most of the adaptations have been made uh, in order to gear the interventions towards the developmental needs of teenagers and young adults. So the folks that we're working with, I think one of the biggest differences is they're younger, and so their experience is different in the world. And so some of the ways in which that shows up include in the area of values, I think that's been very interesting. When you're working with someone in their 30s or 40s, they might more easily tell you what they value. But a young person who is in their teens, early 20s, has recently experienced symptoms of psychosis, you might ask them what they value, and it turns out, you know, they don't know. They haven't had much chance to think about it, and they haven't, um, they might either tell you something like, I don't know, or they'll tell you what they think your, their values are supposed to be, whatever their parents or other people in their life have told, you, told them to value. Some other adaptations include uh, in the area of emotion. Teenagers and young adults are often developmentally very self-focused, and they feel like even in the absence of psychotic symptoms, many teenagers feel like everybody can tell what they're feeling on the inside. And learning that the big secret, uh, that everybody is walking around with self-doubt, fear, insecurities, even if they don't show it on the outside, is sometimes a really new idea for young adults. Additionally, metaphors work for some people and not others. I have some patients I've worked with who just hate the metaphors. I've had folks leave our groups because the metaphors didn't, just didn't work for them. Um, but it's still possible to do acts without metaphors. Um, also, uh, some, I've found that more active present moment and mindfulness exercises can be more useful than meditation. So some people might not like sitting and being still uh, for a sort of meditation-like mindfulness, but other kinds of ideas of embracing the present moment may work a lot better for them. So uh, one way of identifying values is to, oops, I was just playing with my screen. That probably wasn't a good thing. One way of helping identify values I found uh, kind of useful with folks in the Cedar Clinic has been to use the miracle question. This is a metaphor that can be helpful. Uh, we ask young people, if a miracle happened, if I had a magic pill or a magic wand, and when you went to sleep tonight, all of the experiences that are bothering you went away, whether it's worries about whether you're being followed, voices, anxiety, self-doubt, you name it, whether any of, if I could make those internal difficult experiences go away for you while you were sleeping tonight, what would you wake up and do tomorrow? So what would they start to do with their newfound freedom from difficult internal experiences? So most young adults will struggle at first to answer, or they'll tell you about achieving goals, like I get my college degree. But that can start a conversation about what they value and what behaviors they would need to do to start to achieve those goals that they value and act on those values. Another tool we find useful for treatment planning with young adults at our center is called the choice point. We explain that there are two kinds of behaviors. 
those that add to a rich, full, and meaningful life and are in line with values, and those that are not in line with our values and lead us to feel drained and stuck. By personalizing those with the young person and filling them in, it can help to get a sense of what their strengths are as well as their values. So, for example, uh, and this, uh, the choice point is developed by Russ Harris. So, for example, this person values completing schoolwork, helping a friend, playing basketball, and taking care of their health. When their mind gets hooked and stuck, they wind up oversleeping, skipping school, playing too many video games, or overeating. Those of you that work with young people at clinical high risk for psychosis or first episode psychosis, or really any young people at all can probably find these uh, towards, in a way, behaviors pretty familiar. Then uh, we identify the sticky thoughts and feelings that show up and influence behavior. So for this person, it included just the idea that work is too hard, I can't do it, feeling tired, hearing voices telling me I'm dumb, feeling depressed, or just feeling like they can't deal. Once we identify sticky thoughts and feelings that show up and influence behavior, we can then share the goal of treatment. And the goal of treatment is to help these sticky thoughts and feelings have less influence on behavior. So to help them choose what to do based on their values. We're not saying the experiences, we're not saying that sticky thoughts and feelings won't show up anymore. What we're saying is that these sticky thoughts and feelings will have less power and influence over behavior, uh, and that the goal is working on helping them do more of the towards behaviors and fewer of the uh, kind of away from values behaviors. So to our knowledge, no one has yet published a study on ACT for youth at clinical high risk for psychosis. Within our center, we conducted a small trial of ACT, of an ACT intervention that included the following components. So we offered an 11 session group that was adapted from ACT for Life, which is a group for uh, people with psychosis that was developed by Oliver, Morris, Johns, and Byrne. We also added some psychoeducation about clinical high risk for psychosis and some additional exercises that targeted uh, different parts of the ACT triplex that I described earlier. We also offered weekly therapy sessions for six months. And this was an, essentially an open trial. We were actually comparing it to another treatment that combined uh, ACT with a very rich cognitive remediation program called CLUES. Here's a little bit of information about participants. And when we followed up at the end of treatment, we did see that participants were reporting a significant reduction in total positive symptoms on the structured interview for psychosis risk syndromes. They also were reporting uh, a reduction or a, an increase, a reduction in sort of the experiential avoidance uh, behaviors. In particular, folks were, were um, reporting that they were less often trying to distract themselves from or suppress difficult thoughts and feelings, which is exactly what we would be targeting within this intervention. I'm going to finish up by describing a case example. Um, this is a composite of folks that we've treated within the theater clinic. I've just disguised a lot of the details so that no one person would be recognizable as a part of this case example. So Jennifer is a 20-year-old sophomore at a local university. She was referred to Cedar via her college counseling center after failing all of her classes and being placed on academic suspension. Her chief complaint was, oh, somehow my screen just went away. Okay, her chief complaint was, I think my former roommate is trying to spy on me and play mind tricks with me. Jennifer had stopped attending all of her classes and she stopped using her computer and phone due to concern her former roommates might be taking videos of her to post on the internet. And there's an emphasis on might in that she did have some preserved insight that her mind might be playing tricks on her. And that's a an important distinguishing factor between someone that might be 
uh, identified as being having experienced full psychotic symptoms versus someone who met criteria for clinical high risk for psychosis. And her uh, maintained insight did lead her to be referred to the Cedar Clinic rather than the PrEP program for that reason. Jennifer felt extremely guilty, hopeless about failing her classes. She felt like she had failed her family. She didn't understand why they were letting her continue to live with them when she had uh, messed up so badly. She had also cut off contact with all of her friends, feeling like they were a waste of time and that what she really needed to do was spend all of her time studying so that she would complete school. Uh, we know, knew from collateral sources that Jennifer had previously been very high functioning. She was admitted to a competitive university on scholarship. And she had a large circle of friends and participated in a sorority. So as with any client, we started treatment with Jennifer with a case conceptualization. We started by gathering more information about what she valued. And then we identified how her current symptoms, sticky thoughts, and feelings were getting in the way of her functioning. It was clear that Jennifer valued working hard and earning her college degree. And she was experiencing a number of barriers to the kind of student that she wanted to be. Jennifer also shared some stories about her social life in the past and made it clear that she had previously valued friendship and enjoying time with her friends. However, she had currently decided to cut off all contact, feeling like there was no way to balance uh, friendship at, with the need to study and finish college, as well as because she wasn't really trusting a number of people in her friend group. In terms of external barriers, she had been forced to leave school on, on academic leave and had lost her scholarship due to poor grades. And she's someone who, unfortunately, an external barrier that we worked on was that she was not somehow given the option of taking a medical leave from school, which had financial implications for her. In terms of internal barriers, this included lots of sticky thoughts and feelings about herself being a loser for failing school. She felt like a disappointment to herself and her parents, and she wondered why they were allowing her to come home and live with them. Uh, she felt like she had uh, messed up so badly that she should be punished by having to live on her own. She also continued to experience some attenuated psychotic symptoms. She avoided using her phone and computer, and had even started to wonder if a change in the brightness in the family TV might be a sign that she was being watched or recorded. At the same time, she spontaneously expressed doubt about this and insight. She noted, I know I'm probably just being paranoid, and you know, why would my ex-roommate be spending all this time and money that would be necessary to watch me? I'm not doing anything all that interesting. Why am I being so stupid? So she did have a lot of insight, and she was able to kind of have those in mind throughout the treatment process. We didn't need to do uh, much at all about helping her let go of, of um, sort of particular psychotic or attenuated psychotic beliefs. We used the choice point diagram to help her to describe her valued behaviors that she would like to be able to do more of, behaviors that seem to keep her stuck, and the sticky thoughts and feelings that got in the way. We talked about the focus of treatment being on helping her to do the things that matter to her so completing schoolwork, helping her family, exercising, and practicing skills to reduce the power and influence of her sticky thoughts on symptoms and symptoms on her behavior. So, you know, making space for concerns about her computer and phone not being safe while stu still doing the things that matter to her. We also provided a little bit of psychoeducation. So regarding her paranoia experiences, we discussed how her, her thoughts and experiences had fit in on a continuum that can range from more common or normative experiences, like my old roommate wasn't trustworthy. That's a pretty uh, usual thought that uh, will show up for almost anybody that's had roommates and can range to more significant uh, thoughts, like uh, in kind of within the context of the intense pressure at her university. We discussed how people's brains can react in different ways. So some people might be prone to procrastinate or to use drugs or alcohol as a temporary escape. Her brain reacted by becoming more sensitive to signs of danger in her life. 
And in particular, there were some comments that her friend had made that led her to be concerned that her former roommate was spying on her through her computer and phone, and that she might be sharing information about her with other friends. We talked about how distressing this concern was and how it profoundly impacted her ability to concentrate and get her work done. We also talked about how she had always maintained some insight that this experience might be her mind playing tricks on her, so she was kind of in this place. And that if the symptoms became more pronounced, um, she might have more difficulty kind of noticing that her mind was playing tricks on her. So a more pronounced version of this experience would involve 100% conviction that these thoughts were real. In regards to further understanding the relationship between symptoms and stress, we used a metaphor developed by Brabin and Turkington known as the stress vulnerability bucket. Many of you might be familiar with the stress vulnerability model. It looks a lot like math. Um, on one side we have vulnerability factors, on the other side we have stress, and as vulnerability goes up stress, and stress goes up, you, uh, the person is more likely to develop symptoms. While it's a really useful concept, I haven't, we haven't yet found a lot of luck in engaging young people in a model that looks like math. So we really uh, find that the stress vulnerability bucket is a more useful model to work with. So in order to help her understand, we use this to help her better understand the factors that made her vulnerable to experiencing paranoia and the stressors that had an impact on her. So here is the bucket. The shape and size of her bucket depends on early life experiences, genetics, um, not much that she could do about that. What goes into the bucket are stressors, and some uh, stressors that were relevant for her included starting college, relationship stress, um, trouble sleeping, unhealthy eating, and using energy drinks. When the bucket gets full, that's when symptoms uh, develop and boil over, and for her, she started to have some trouble telling what's real from what's not. The good news in the bucket is that you can poke holes. Uh, and so the holes in the bucket relieve the pressure off the top. And these are the healthy lifestyle behaviors that a person can do that helps them to reduce their vulnerability to symptoms. And so uh, she was able to identify a number of things that she could do that were healthy behaviors to help increase her resilience. So once we developed more clarity about Jennifer's values and had worked on providing some psychoeducation to help her begin to have more compassion for herself about the situation she was in, we were able to work on helping her identify some valued actions to take. She enrolled in community college classes and knew she would need to use her laptop and phone to be successful. After a few sessions in which we worked on increasing her willingness, she agreed to bring in her laptop and phone to our sessions, and she began reconnecting to the various programs she had disconnected to when she was more acutely paranoid. She was able to practice noticing the feelings and thoughts that showed up for her as she turned on and used her computer. And she practiced making space for those experiences rather than trying to make them go away. Over the course of several sessions and several weeks of practicing using her computer and phone and reconnecting to the various apps, this began to feel a bit easier for her. And she had resumed using almost all the functions of her phone and her computer. Jennifer also took some steps to re-engage with friends. She returned a text from one of her best friends and made arrangements to see her. It turns out this friend was extremely supportive and accepting when Jennifer told her about what had been going on over the last few months at school. And this helped Jennifer become more willing to reach out to and connect with other friends again as well. And she even went and visited her sorority house. As Jennifer continued to re-engage in life, she developed more compassion for herself and a better understanding of how her attenuated positive symptoms had impacted her. She successfully completed two semesters of, college, of community college and then advocated for herself to return to her university. 
So for folks that are interested in learning more about ACT, the good news is that there are a number of different resources that are available uh, for free, uh, lots that can be learned about ACT very easily. I highly recommend that you join the Association for Contextual and Behavioral Science, which includes a number of resources, manuals, and uh, lots of opportunities to learn more about ACT as well as other um, third wave uh, uh, behavioral treatments. There's also a number of wonderful uh, books that focus on ACT for psychosis or further reading for learning about ACT in working with uh, all clients as well as young adults. There's a number of online resources for learning more about ACT and all of these uh, slides will be uh, posted or made available on our website. And now I'd like to open things up, uh, maybe invite Brandon to join us again, and we can open things up for people to in the audience to ask questions. Um, so if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat, um, and then I'll read them out and Michelle and Brandon can answer them. A couple of thank yous. You're welcome. There's a lot of really cool resources. Um, so, and also, I'll just mention that we'll be emailing out a PDF of the slides, um, and we'll also, once this is posted on our website, which hopefully should be in the next week or two, um, I'll be emailing that out as well. All folks okay, um, so there's one question here from Susan Gingrich. Um, she asks, how do you see ACT being incorporated on a coordinated specialty care team? Um, what member of the team would provide it? Susan, thanks very much for your question. And I, um, I actually would argue ACT is a philosophy behind the work with clients. So my argument is actually that everybody on the team would be offering ACT in some ways. So on our team, you know, uh, ACT is part of the philosophy that the therapists work with. Also, it's part of the philosophy that our school and work coaches work with. So uh, Emma Parrish is a school and work coach on our team, and when she's working with folks in CEDAR on embracing life by applying for jobs and contacting professors and working on schoolwork, she is also helping them make room for difficult thoughts, feelings, and experiences that show up while doing things that matter. So I would say anyone on the team can incorporate ACT within the work that they do. It's not necessarily a set of techniques that needs to be done to a person in a certain amount of sessions. It's really a philosophy behind the treatment. Great. Um, we also have another question about how much training do staff need in order to be able to effectively implement ACT? You want me to fill that one, uh, Michelle? That sounds good because you've done a lot of work directly on training new staff. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, that's it, it really kind of, uh, you know, the short answer is, of course, it depends, right? So it depends on um, what the previous training is, um, how familiar they are with um, sort of psychotherapeutic approaches or psychosocial approaches for severe mental illness to begin with. Um, I think that it also depends on sort of the scope of their work, and what role they're functioning. So, um, y you know, in terms of our inpatient unit, we had a, a relatively Describe protocols that we were asking staff to learn. So we, but sort of as as Michelle said, one of the big issues is that, you know, ACT isn't really just a set of techniques, and really that's that's not really what it is at all. Technically, um, it's really about a philosophy, case conceptualization, overall way um, to approach treatment and, and working with patients. And so, um, you know, I, I think that that tends to come over time. It's not like you can just do a seminar um, We can't hear you anymore. 
think your headset might have turned off. Hello? Better. Sorry about that. My uh, headset cut out. But what I was just saying is that, um, you know, it, it is a sort of an ongoing process, and I think you can get up to speed relatively quickly, but take uh, continued kind of supervision and training and support, I think, to implement things well, just I think like any other treatment. Great. And then we also have another question. Um, do you think this could be adapted to work with a younger population, um, so children's ages 9 plus with prodromal symptoms? Um, I would say so. I mean, I think, you know, when you're working with somebody, a younger population, and there are ACT protocols for children as well, you're not only working with the young person, you're also working with their parents as well. And, you know, whereas, you know, certain ideas you would modify depending on the individual, like metaphors, maybe something that is harder for some of the younger kids to grasp in different ways or might need to be changed up. The idea of, of helping a person figure out what kind of kid they want to be and doing more of the things that matter to them as kids and having, you know, thoughts and feelings that are yucky that get in the way, not get in the way so much, I think is a pretty compatible idea. And then when working with parents, I think that is very valuable as well to help parents think about, you know, not only you know, sort of helping their kid, but how they value and what they want their relationship with the young person to be like and how they want to parent and helping them identify their values as a parent in terms of guiding difficult actions that they might need to take in order to best serve um, and participate in treatment uh, is also something that uh, can be useful. Awesome. Um, and then I think we have one more time for one more question. Um, this is from Chris, um, and he says, "Act sounds like it helps youth identify how their assumptions may be rooted in their cultural or family backgrounds. Um, what is it like implementing this kind of therapy or philosophy when doing family therapy with CHR youth parents, especially when those parents may reinforce those assumptions?" So again. Yeah, Oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead, Brandon. No, please, go ahead. Uh, so, you know, again, I would say that one of the things that's nice about ACT is, is in kind of working with folks from a number of different cultural backgrounds is that really the emphasis is on helping people identify what they value and what matters to them. It's not our values. It's not you know, sort of us imposing, you know, as a treatment team, our ideas on that person. And so with families, uh, family work is, is something I, I do a lot of. And sometimes it's tricky because there may be different members of the family that value different things. Or often the different members of the family have some overlapping values. But they have very different opinions about what each person needs to do in order to achieve goals or uh, live, you know, sort of more according to values. And so part of that work is helping to kind of connect with each person around, you know, again, the relationship and how they want to be. And sometimes, uh, you know, it, it makes sense to kind of better understand if a family member has a very different viewpoint on what the young person needs. Sometimes it's very helpful to get a better sense of where their ideas about that came from. So maybe they're experiencing some fused beliefs or ideas or rules or assumptions. And better understanding those can be very helpful. And sometimes just by listening and, and connecting with the family about where those values and beliefs come from can help create a little bit of space around it that might sort of help uh, if there's a, a kind of issue between the family reinforcing one message that's different from the treatment team. Absolutely. Yeah, and I would just add briefly that, um, yeah, I, I definitely agree, Michelle, and, and, you know, this act is designed to be a contextual behavioral uh, intervention, and so really context is king, and so do, trying to do this uh, intervention in isolation uh, and, and not um, sort of consider and take into account how this is going to affect the people around them, 
how they're interacting with them. This includes both their other treatment providers as well as their family and friends. And, you know, we've always tried to um, integrate some family elements where we can uh, in, in the work that I've done, whether it's family meetings on the inpatient unit or whether for outpatient, uh, inviting family members to uh, a session or two to get everybody hopefully on the same page, at least understanding what the goals are, what the approach is, because that is something that can, I think, be an issue with um, sometimes implementing ACT treatment is if uh, other people don't understand what's going on or are reinforcing the exact opposite uh, for the individual, then that can create, create conflicts. And I think, you know, we want to think through that very carefully and also uh, involve um, family members in care uh, as it makes sense to do. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you so much, Michelle and Brandon, for such an excellent webinar. And thank you all um, to all of our participants. Thank you so much for attending. This is our first webinar for the Early Psychosis Learning Collaborative, and I'm thrilled that we had such a good turnout. Um, please consider reaching out to us at any time um, with technical assistance. Um, and also, please fill out our evaluation. It'll just take a couple minutes. Um, we really would appreciate your honest feedback about the webinar, um, and it'll help us to plan future programs. The link is in the webinar notes, and we'll also send it to your email. Um, we'll also send out the PDF, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and again, if you're interested in the Early Psychosis Learning Collaborative or the MHGTC, um, you can sign up then as well. Um, thank you so much again, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, and I also, I just got a uh, question in the comments. Who may we contact for additional questions? Um, you can email the MHCTC website, um, or website, the MHCTC email, um, which you can find on our MHCTC website, and then we'll have um, them forward all of the questions to Michelle and Brandon directly. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much.